we are so exposed to pleasure and so insulated from pain that we have individually and collectively reset our pleasure pain pathways to the side of pain. And that makes us very, very unhappy. This could be right outside the threshold of conscious awareness. So I'm not walking around going, I'm unhappy and restless and irritable because I ate too much chocolate cake. No, I'm saying to myself, wow, I'm unhappy, I'm restless or irritable. Maybe I need a new spouse. Maybe I need a new job. Maybe I need new friends. And these are the kinds of subtle results of compulsive overconsumption that we don't see when we're in the moment. This is the counterintuitive paradoxical piece of this. To bring ourselves some little modicum of relief, we need to reject those things that give us immediate pleasure and embrace the things that are hard. On today's episode, I talk about why the little things we're addicted to can make us so incredibly unhappy and the simple ways we can find balance with Dr. Anna Lemke. To kick off, of course, you are a psychiatrist. You're also the chief of Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University. You are a specialist when it comes to opioid uh, crisis that we're dealing. And you're the author of two books, including this one, the New York Times bestseller, your latest book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. Now, I have to say, I'm going to be honest with you, this book scared the out of me. (laughs) I think because I realized how prevalent this is in our society, this chasing dopamine, chasing achievements. And really what scared me the most is just how prevalent this is in our world. Can you walk us through why this is such a big challenge for us today? Well, you, you got the central thesis of the book, which is great, which is that we are living in this dopamine overloaded world even so-called natural rewards, things like finding food, clothing, shelter, a mate, have been drugified in the modern world, making us all more vulnerable to the problem of compulsive overconsumption, otherwise known as addiction. Um, so, you know, you hit the hit the nail on the head. What makes something addictive? Increased quantity, increased potency, increased novelty, and increased access. And of course, access has become. 24 seven, as I talk about in the book, our smartphone is essentially the equivalent of the hypodermic syringe delivering digital dopamine 24 seven for our wired generation. So we can't get away from it. Even when we try, I have, you know, patients addicted to various forms of pornography who are constantly getting alerts and messages in their inbox. Come look at this, come, you know, come hang out. So even when they're trying to abstain, uh, you know, the, the technology is running after them. Um, And the central problem there is that when we're constantly bombarding uh, our reward pathway with dopamine, we actually end up in a dopamine deficit state. And that makes us very, very unhappy. Oh, I cannot wait to get into that because the way that you illustrate the, the, the power struggle, so to speak, between getting that happiness, that pleasure, that dopamine hit, and then the gremlins, as you call it, that kind of comes on the back end. Um, I noticed that, of course, in my own life, I think, I think we've all felt that. But the reason why I wanted to actually, the reason I got into your book and I wanted to have you on the podcast was this really weird, random story. Over Christmas, I'm listening to a book by one of my favorite comedians, a British comedian named Jimmy Carr. And he writes a memoir that turns out not to be a memoir. It turns out to be a self-help book. And just in passing, like he doesn't go into any depth, but just in passing, he says, we're all addicted to something. You know, if you're, if you're addicted, if you spend all your time thinking about sports and watching sports, then that's an addiction. And if you spend all of your time, you know, focused on work or focused on health, if you spend all of your time on this thing, whether it's, it, it doesn't have to be a drug, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a, a, an addictive substance right. for us to spend all of our time on that. And just that passing statement made me think, my goodness, what, how often do we all do the things that we just kind of do because they're a nice distraction? You know, they're a distraction from the mediocrity or the boredom. It's a distraction from um, fear and thinking, you know, all of these things I have ahead of me or whatever it is. And, and that was really why I started to dig into this more because I thought we all suffer from these, the, this feeling of wanting to distract ourselves or check out from certain parts of our life. Is this totally universal? I I mean, I think it's becoming more and more universal. You know, the world as it's, as we've engineered it, because we have built this world, there's this concept of the Anthropocene, 
which is this idea that for the first time in the history of humanity, um, our actions have changed our environment on a very large scale. That's, uh, you know, one of the evidences of that is pollution and and uh, the ways in which we've changed our planet due to our consumptive behavior, polluting our planet. But the other very real way that we've changed our planet is, again, we now have infinite access to highly reinforcing uh, drugs and behaviors at the touch of a fingertip. And I would even go so far as to say, it's not that we are all now vulnerable to constant distraction. It's that our default mode network uh, our default way of being in the world is actually to distract ourselves. And the times that we allow ourselves to be actually fully present in the real world are few and far between. Hmm. Now, in your book, you share a story of a patient who uh, found that they were always consuming. They're listening to podcasts. They're listening to music. They they're always have the earbuds in their ears. Now, this, this, this is kind of me to a T. My 15-year-old daughter always has her, you know, AirPods in, is always listening to something. And I used to joke because I, I used to say, it's like, it's a, it's, a, it's a great soundtrack to life or it's a great distraction. Why would you, why would you just do nothing? And, and yet I, I kind of understand the irony of the fact that you and I are here on a podcast on a show <laughs> pr- producing content that people can yeah. consume so they can learn more stuff. But, but this is, again, this is, this is prevalent. And, and so I guess the question I have is, at what point, how do we define the undefinable when at one point it's like, we know we're all doing it. We know it's actually can be an issue and we'll dig into why this is such an mm. issue and, and why it's almost um, hidden, why, why, why the kind of evil parts, so to speak, are kind of like hidden about how much it may be hurting you. But, but we're, this is just the norm. So at what point does it move from being something that's okay to something that actually might be hurting us? Broadly speaking, The definition of addiction is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior despite harm to self and or others. And in fact, if you look at the sort of diagnostic criteria for any mental illness in the DSM-5, which is our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, almost all of them are ultimately defined by those criteria when it crosses over into harm to self or others which is to say we're all on the spectrum somewhere for many different mental health disorders, right? I mean, we all like have parts of ourselves that are sort of obsessive compulsive. We all, you know, can get a little moody, but really crosses over and interferes uh, with our, our well-being, the well-being of those around us, our ability to function that we say, okay, that is a mental illness. And when it comes to addiction, that can be sort of succinctly defined as the four C's, out of control use, compulsive use, craving, and continued use despite consequences. There are also two physiologic signs that are included in those criteria. One is tolerance, needing more and more of our drug over time to get the same effect, or finding that at the same dose, the drug's no longer working. And number two, withdrawal. When we don't have access to the drug, we experience some form of withdrawal. Now, with substances that we ingest, This is typically a physiologic kind of physical symptoms, but the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance are actually psychological or psychiatric signals. And those are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. For example, I have a lot of pot smokers who say, well, I'm not addicted because I can just stop and I, I don't have any kind of withdrawal. Then I'll say, well, I mean, are you more anxious? Are you having trouble sleeping? Are you thinking a lot about using pot? Because those would all be uh, potential markers of, uh, of an addiction. And so if we're speaking in the clinical kind of setting of people who have reached the point of addiction, whether it's alcohol or substances, whether it's uh, sexual in nature or whatever it might be, I think a lot of us might say, well, you know, I'm not that bad. But when we speak outside of those into the everyday life, if we're high achievers or we're entrepreneurs or we want to make something happen, we have a goal that is lofty and is big. And in truth, anything that kind of distracts us from that uh, kind of holds us back from achieving the very thing we want. I know for myself, if I'm ever trying to hit a weight loss goal or look a certain way or feel a certain way in the morning time, super easy to be bold and confident right before bed. I'm not making the smartest choices. (laughs) You know, I'm (laughs) like, like current Mark, like this moment, Mark, just goes, well, 
who cares if four weeks later I don't look as good as I want because in the moment, you know, the food or whatever it might be. And so what I'm trying to hit on is outside of, of the classic definition of addiction, there are still these things that pull us away from what we, who we want to be and what we mm-hmm. want to achieve and where we want to go. Where do we play in that middle ground? Because, because it, it, again, this seems serious to me. As I read your book, I was yeah. like, this is the yeah. thing that's keeping me from turning into the person I want to be. Mm, okay. All right. Well, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, addiction is a spectrum disorder, right? It's not just a, an on off switch that there's a continuum. And even before we cross that threshold into having a diagnosable addictive disorder, there is compulsive overconsumption, which frankly, we're, we're all engaging in, in some form or another, which is the point of the book, right? So we're essentially all on that continuum somewhere. And the same kinds of evolutionarily conserved neural circuits that get us to reflexively approach pleasure and avoid pain are operational in all of us and have been for millions of years of evolution unchanged and are conserved across species. So this is a highly phylogenetically and evolutionarily conserved neural circuit that has very powerful effects on our choices. And again, essentially it just comes down to the reflexive desire to approach pleasure and avoid pain, which is what has kept us alive in a world of scarcity and ever-present danger and is what is causing all kinds of malfunctions in this world of overwhelming overabundance. You know, when you talk about sort of getting to the end of the day and finding that you're not making the same good choices you, you would make when you first woke up, that's a really salient point. It speaks to Uh, the notion of willpower. So willpower is essentially our ability to direct our energies to choose certain things and not others. And energy is an expendable resource, right? It's not infinite. We do in fact wake up with more willpower than we have at the end of the day. And one of the things I talk about in Dopamine Nation is that, you know, essentially in order to live a balanced life in a world that's constantly beckoning us to overconsume, we have to create these literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice so that we're not relying exclusively on willpower. Because if we just rely on willpower, we're all going to lose. You know, If you wait until you're in the moment of desire to reach for that drug of choice and it's easily accessible, trust me, you will reach for it and so will I. Right. So the, the trick is to make sure that when I still have adequate willpower, I create barriers between myself and myself and my drug of choice, such that in the moment of desire, when I reach for it, it's not readily available. Right. And that pause might be just enough to help me pass over that moment of desire and kind of enlist whatever my higher goals are and keep moving. So you're saying late at night when I'm all alone dipping Oreos in peanut butter, and I know that I shouldn't be doing that. I should, I should clear the house of Oreos and peanut butter. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. So you have to anticipate those moments, recognize um, that we are animals and that this basic physiology is incredibly compelling and powerful. And again, in, in all of us, and that, um, you know, presented with Oreos and peanut butter right in front of us late at night, if that's our drug of choice, we will reach for it. We will not be able to not reach for it. So the trick is, again, to create a kind of um, micro environment in our broadly ad- more addictive environment in order to help us stay the course and, you know, go- head where we really want to go and where we know, you know, we can live our our most fulfilling lives, our best selves, all that sort of thing. Now for me, and I'm sure for every single person who's watching this, you've experienced this. Think about this moment in your life, the lead up and the excitement around a vacation, right? Like the idea of going on a trip, especially right now, I cannot wait for another trip, but but here's a perfect example. I was thinking about this. My wife and I, we like to go to Jamaica. And the first day that you're at a resort, it's stunning. You know, the food is just so tasty. The drinks are flowing. The sun is out. Just, it's like the greatest feeling in the world. But on vacation, how do you feel by day six or by day seven? You just feel gross. You feel so down. And I hear people say like, oh, I'm just ready to go home. 
but there's clearly something else that's happening here. There's a change because the first few days, everything is fun and amazing. And then by the end, you feel terrible. You've had too much to eat. You've had too much to drink. You've just laid around and done nothing. And so the question becomes like, why might this shift, this shift from feeling amazing to feeling terrible, why might this be happening? To understand, you know, how this happens, how sort of this pursuit of pleasure for its own sake leads to pain, um, it's important to understand how pleasure and pain are processed in the brain. And one of the most compelling findings in neuroscience in the last hundred years or so is that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So if you imagine that in your brain, there's a balance like a board on a center fulcrum, a little bit like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground. But when it's at rest, that board is level or parallel with the ground. That represents how pain and pleasure are processed. When we do something pleasurable, it tilts one way. When we do something painful, it tilts the other. Now, there are certain rules governing this balance. And one of them is that the balance wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tilted for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And, And in fact, any deviation from neutrality is the biological definition of stress, which is ironic because we often turn to substances to escape stress, but actually uh, that deviation from homeostasis causes cortisol release and is a source of stress. But uh, so essentially um, the question then becomes, well, how does the this balance reset itself with a deviation from neutrality? And that's very, very interesting because what it does is with wh- whatever the initial stimulus is, let's say I eat a piece of chocolate, I, my balance tilts to the side of pleasure, I get a little release of dopamine in my brain's reward pathway. Dopamine is our pleasure, motivation, and reward neurotransmitter, and I feel good. But immediately, no sooner has that happened than my brain adapts to that increased dopamine by downregulating my own dopamine production and transmission, not just to baseline levels, but below baseline levels to a dopamine deficit state, which is a really interesting thing, right? Like, why does the brain do that? Why doesn't it just go to baseline? Why does it go below baseline? By the way, one of the ways to imagine this is imagine that there are these little neuroadaptation gremlins that hop on the pain side of my balance in response to any deviation uh, to the pleasure side, but they like it on the balance. So they don't get off as soon as the balance is level. They stay on like they're on an amusement park ride until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect or that moment of wanting to have one more piece of chocolate, watch one more YouTube video, smoke one more cigarette. Now, if we wait long enough, the gremlins hop off and balance is restored and that intense feeling of craving passes. But what if we don't don't wait? What if we continue to do that behavior or consume uh, that substance repeatedly over a period of time? What happens is we essentially get more and more gremlins accumulating on the pain side of the balance And if we do that behavior for weeks to months to years, we end up with enough gremlins to fill this whole room. And they're now camped out there, tents and barbecues in tow, right? That's their new home. This is what happens when we get into the addicted brain. And what does that imply for us? That means we need more and more of our pleasurable substance and more potent forms to get the same effect. And we eventually get to a point where no matter how much we consume, and no no matter how, how potent it is, it really stops working. Remember, that's tolerance. Now I need to use it not to feel high, but just to temporarily level the balance and feel normal. And when I'm not using it, my balance is tilted to the side of pain and I'm walking around around in a state of withdrawal. What are the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance? Anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving. And remember, this could be right outside the threshold of conscious awareness. So I'm not walking around going, oh, wow, I'm unhappy and restless and irritable because, you know, I ate too much chocolate cake. No, I'm saying to myself, wow, I'm unhappy. I'm restless or irritable. Maybe I need a new spouse. Maybe I need a new job. Maybe I need new friends. But in fact, what I've done is I've reset my hedonic or joy set point so that I'm actually in this state of withdrawal. And these are the kinds of subtle results or sequelae of compulsive overconsumption that we don't see when we're in the moment, right? We really don't appreciate the true cause and effect. We might feel like a hangover if we drink too much alcohol. So those obvious come downs we we might appreciate, but it's the more subtle enduring dopamine deficit state that we don't see. And I think that this is happening to us individually, but also collectively as nations and in part explains the increasing rates of depression 
anxiety and suicide that we're seeing the world over, which by the way, are highest in rich nations, completely paradoxical. You would think, wow, you know, the richest countries, they have the most stuff, you know, they have the best doctors, but in fact, we're so exposed to pleasure and so insulated from pain that we have individually and collectively reset our pleasure pain pathways to the side of pain so that we're now in, in, essentially engaged uh, in a war with our gremlins. And these, these behaviors, these addictions, uh, many of them are kind of wrapped up in this idea of shame as well. You know, especially if we're not acting the way we want to act or, you know, if, if we're trying to actively stop those actions, those behaviors, those activities, and then we relapse. I mean, there's, there's all these stories we're telling ourselves as well. So does that play anything into it in terms of now I'm starting to define myself as the person who does X or Y or Z because I keep doing these behaviors? Oh, absolutely. So the, the, the stories we tell about what we do uh, and why we do it are fundamental, not just to sort of shaping our understanding of our past, but actually create the maps uh, for choices going forward. And when we lie about how we're over consuming um, substances and behaviors, what we do is we're, we're creating false narratives, essentially. And those false narratives then allow us to continue that compulsive overuse uh, without having to really look at the, the true consequences. And this happens, by the way, on a neurobiological level. So if you think about that pleasure pain balance as existing in the oldest, lowest parts of our brain, what we sometimes refer to as lizard brain, because it's again, conserved for so many millions of years and across species. So that's where your balance resides. But one of the key circuits in the brain is in fact, between our prefrontal cortex, which is the large gray matter part of our brain right behind the forehead and those reward pathways down, uh, down in the, the older parts of the brain. And those two parts of the brain, when things are going well, are constantly talking to each other. The prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain involved in future planning, delayed gratification and storytelling, right? So when my prefrontal cortex is online, it is actually working to effectively regulate my pleasure pain balance and allow me to have access to what the gremlins are doing. But what happens in addiction is we essentially sever those connections so that the pleasure pain balance and the gremlins are driving the bus without us really encoding in the prefrontal cortex what is going on there. And when we do that, we're, we're telling stories that aren't true. And these are stories that our gremlins are very happy with because then they get to kind of, uh, you know, control the day. So one of the key, key messages in my book about how to manage this problem of compulsive overconsumption or addiction is to, to tell the truth, to actively and intentionally engage in what, what I call radical honesty, tell the truth about things large and small, not just the things related to our overconsumption, but about everything. And by doing that, we essentially stimulate or upregulate our prefrontal cortex, make it stronger and potentially strengthen the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the pleasure pain pathways so that we can gain some modicum over uh, a control over, over what's happening in that regard. This is why <laughs> it's both um, really exciting to, to learn about these things and to realize that there is an opportunity for us to be aware of them for us to take control of them and, and potentially uh, change our life, like yeah. to, to actually work on the things that we don't like, the things that are holding us back. Now, I want to I want to hit this point home because I feel like it's so important, but kind of nuanced. If you have a substance abuse issue or if you have an addiction to substances or kind of really what would be considered erratic behavior, um, one, this is something that we all need to work on because we all have a little slice of that somewhere in our life, I believe. But, but more, more, more so for those of us who are the high achievers, for those of us who have the big dreams, the big goals and want to make something happen, these, these little give you a pass on. You know, like for me, I, I can use the, the Oreos and, uh, and peanut, peanut butter, butter as an example. And I say that is like, and, and everyone in my life will say, Mark, you work out, whatever, you work out 12 hours a week and you have do this and you do that. And you're so careful here and you fast there. What's the big deal? But I know that this is the thing that's actually hurting me. Yeah. I know that I'm not hitting any of my goals I want to hit. I know that I feel terrible 
the next day after, you know, I, I binge on something and I'm going to meet my personal trainer and I'm going to have a weigh in and I'm going to let all these people down. Like, like I spend so much time and energy carrying around this guilt, this shame. And it's such a small little thing that everyone would give me a pass on. Yeah. And, and that's, but, but it's still important that we address these issues, these little things that are holding us back that everyone else would say, it's no big deal at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's interesting that kind of shame or, you know, self-condemnation or negative self-talk, it's a, it's a potent double-edged sword. On the one hand, if that voice is too powerful, that can drive us to use our drug of choice as a way to just, you know, turn those voices off for a while. On the other hand, you know, that element of our sort of shame or, or self-awareness or, or conscience can be when channeled appropriately, a powerful motivator to change behavior and wanting to avoid the experience of shame then becomes one of the central motivations in order to continue on the, let's say, the good path. Um, so it's it's really tricky. I talk about in the book, the difference between pro-social shame, which I think is helpful and important and, and is important to let ourselves experience as a way to motivate us to change behavior, but also uh, destructive shame, which is a a type of shame which overwhelms us, causes lying and isolation, and then perpetuates these behaviors. You know, the the link to getting out of destructive shame and into pro-social shame really begins with radical honesty and being truthful to ourselves and those we care about and who care about us about what we're actually doing. It sounds so simple to say it, just tell the truth, but it's actually really hard. The average adult tells one to two lies per day. Mostly we're lying about little things like why we're late for the meeting, but those little lies can add up to the big lies. And when I work with, and I work with lots of wonderful people in you know robust sustained recovery from very serious addictions. And one of the things they've taught me is they say, Dr. Lempke, I can't lie about anything. I mean, it's not even a matter of not lying about drug use. If I even lie about you know, again, you know, what, what, how, what I'm reading or where I had dinner or, you know, why I'm, why I'm late, that then kicks off this lying habit, which is really so deeply enmeshed in the problem of compulsive overconsumption and addiction. So uh, I think it's a very simple but powerful place to start is this radical honesty. Try to go through a 24 hour period and don't lie about anything. So if at this point you're watching and you're anything like me, the hair on the back of your neck is standing up right now. You know, as I'm, as I'm reading Dr. Anna's books and as I'm learning about her and as I'm going through the research, I, I'm just, I'm thinking, oh my, this, oh, she's talking to me. Because if you're a high achiever, you know, you know that there are things that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. You know that there are things that are keeping you from hitting your goal. You, I know that there are things that are keeping me from hitting my goals. And so we know this. So the question immediately becomes, what can we do about it? But so much of what the research shows, and so much of what Dr. Anna writes about uh, appears to me isn't what we should be doing about it. It's what we need to stop doing. Well, I think the advice is proactive and practical and can some be really broken down into three things. Number one, figure out what is that substance or behavior that you have that conflicted relationship that you use more than you would like, or that leaves you feeling worse off afterwards because it creates this dopamine deficit state. And then set a quit date to abstain from that behavior for long enough for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off the pain side of the balance So that baseline healthy dopamine homeostasis or a level balance can be restored. How long should that be in my clinical experience for people who have crossed into the threshold of addiction? It takes on average 30 days to restore a level balance. Now, there are people for whom that might happen sooner. There are people for whom that might take longer, but 30 days is sort of on average what it takes to reset reward pathways. I always warn patients of a couple of things. Number one, you will feel worse before you feel better because as soon as you stop, you know, pressing on the pain side of balance with your drug of choice, those gremlins, they don't, you know, they're camped out there. So that's going to tilt your balance to the side of pain. You're going to be restless, irritable, 
depressed, anxious, but it's time limited. It's not going to be what you're left with when the experiment is done. It's really going to last about two weeks. Those gremlins will start to hop off the pain side of the balance and you will begin to experience the rewards of a reset dopamine level. And that comes in all kinds of ways. You'll be less anxious, less depressed, less irritable, sleep better, and you'll be able to focus on and enjoy more modest rewards. So that's the first step. I want to put a couple caveats on that. If you're someone who's severely addicted and you've repeatedly tried to stop on your own and have been unable to, don't do this experiment. Go get medical help, go to rehab, go to a day treatment program, get more assistance. Or if you're somebody who's physically dependent on alcohol or benzodiazepines like Xanax, such that you could experience seizures or a life-threatening withdrawal, if you were to stop, don't do this experiment. Go see a medical professional and get help with a medically managed detoxification. But barring those extreme circumstances, this is an experiment that all of us and any of us can do, and it's incredibly enlightening. Number two, you can press on the pain side of the balance. Why would you ever wanna do that? Because those gremlins are ag agnostic to whatever the initial stimulus was. If you press on the pain side of the balance, those gremlins are perfectly happy to hop on the pleasure side to bring it level again. And remember, they don't hop off right when you're level. They stay on until you're tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that feels good, right? Now you've got your dopamine indirectly. This is the science of hormesis, which is Greek to set in motion. Basically what it means is when we press on the pain side of the balance, by, for example, exercising or doing ice cold water baths or um, doing intermittent fasting or even doing things that are psychologically or cognitively challenging, we essentially promote those gremlins to hop on the pleasure side and we get our dopamine indirectly. And that dopamine is potentially more enduring. We don't get this sudden release and then this dopamine deficit state. Instead, we get a gradual increase that primarily persists after we finish that activity. So that's the runner's high, right? Like I don't like doing exercise, but I feel great afterward. And then I settle back down to my baseline. So it ultimately helps us reset to the side of pleasure. And then the third thing to do is to practice radical honesty. So start being truthful about what we're doing, how much we're doing, the things that we've kept hidden, the things that we're doing on the internet that we'd rather people not know. Start letting people know, be honest about it. How much time am I actually spending you know, using that app? Uh, what is it actually interfering with in my life? Uh, why do I do it? It feels good during, but how do I feel afterwards? Kind of like your buffet at the uh, at your you know at your vacation. Yeah, tastes great, feels good the first two or three days. By day seven, you feel awful about yourself. Was it really worth it? You know, was it in retrospect? Was that is that really how I want to spend my next vacation? Right. So like starting to think that through, and then also just being honest about like other little stuff. Because what that probably does is it probably stimulates and upregulates that prefrontal cortex. Remember, that's the gray area matter right behind our forehead. So important for delayed gratification, future planning, and storytelling. And so when we're telling truthful stories, we are stimulating our prefrontal cortex. When we're stimulating our prefrontal cortex, we're able to create connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens, which is that pleasure pain pathway. And then we can be aware of and manage the gremlins, which we can't do if our prefrontal cortex is offline. Okay. I understand that if we attack these hard things, of course, this is, we do hard things. So this is, this is everything that we're Perfect. about here. Yeah. So if we attack those hard things, I understand why it could help us get off of the addiction of choice. In your book, you reference a quote that says, every pleasure comes at a cost. Right. I'm wondering if we can if we can hack it, <laughs> stay, stay with the pleasure of choice and insert the cost of choice. Like, like if, um, you know, going for a 10 K run is something that's really hard for you. Can you just start running more as hard and as painful as that is, and just go ahead and do that and still stay with the things that you like doing for whatever reasons? Or is this just like you're trying to eat your cake or have your cake and eat it too? It doesn't really work. It's super short term. There's, there's no way around abstaining from the things that you do. You have to initially abstain to reset reward pathways. 
just by engaging in pain, you're not going to do that. What, what you're going to do is end up with, you know, a pleasure pain balance that's like massively tilting one way and another in alternating moments. And remember, the biological definition of stress is a deviation from homeostasis. So anytime you deviate from baseline, you are stressing your physiology. And that means you are setting off a cortisol response, right? You're upregulating your own adrenaline. By the way, that can be people's addiction, right? Just adrenaline itself, that sort of risky, you know, high-paced, dangerous life can in and of itself be, be the drug of choice. But ultimately, your, your, your body isn't made for that. You can't keep up with that. Um, and so by constantly asking your body to tilt hard to the side of pain and then tilt hard to the side of pleasure and getting this kind of work hard, play hard mentality, which by the way is incredibly common now, it, you won't make it. You know, you're, you're going to just yeah. exhaust the balance. You're going to break I, it essentially. I was going to say that it's almost encouraged in entrepreneurship, in, uh, you know, in, in Western culture, this idea of being super busy and, right. and and look at how busy I am and look at how little I sleep and look how much I take on and look at how I don't have any time for self-care or any of those things. Right. Uh, I could see where this cycle of pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain doesn't really solve, I guess, the problem of what I'm trying to solve for. It also doesn't mean that you can never indulge. The idea is that you have to space out your indulgences um, with enough time in between so that the gremlins can hop off. What you don't want to do is get into that repetitive use where you essentially uh, reset um, you know, your pleasure pain balance and end up with a lot of gremlins on the pain side. So it's okay to indulge in moderation right now, every, every now and then, um, assuming that you can handle that. Now, people with severe addiction, they you know, often can't do that. Once they indulge, they're often running again and they're, they're in their addiction and they're using compulsively. And it's really every time you get out of that and have to get into recovery, it's incredibly painful. Some people die of their addictions. So again, lots of caveats here. Some people will be able to use in moderation. Others will not. Sometimes the process of experimentation alone will determine who's who. But I do think that the, the, the discussion of moderation is an important one because there are drugs that we can't just abstain from, right? Food is one of them. Food has become drugified, fat, sugar, salt, processed, who knows what, right? We, but we got to eat food. So then we got to think about, okay, how can I eat in a way that keeps, maintains my balance, right? Do I cut out sugar? Do I cut out cakes and cookies? Do I do intermittent fasting where I only eat during certain hours of the day? What works for me in order to maintain my balance? Devices, right? You cannot participate in the modern world and not engage with these devices unless you decide to be Amish or something, but my understanding is that even the Amish now have smartphones. So there's really no getting away to it, getting away from it. So we have to figure, okay, how do I, how do I moderate my use? Do I do intermittent fasting with my devices? Say I'm only going to use between the hours of nine and five or 12 and eight or something like that. That's not a bad way to go. Do I say, well, I'm going to use you know, a laptop, but not a smartphone or a smartphone or not a laptop, or I'm only going to use on these days, or I'm only going to use on these apps. These are the ways we have to think about sort of how to moderate, but, uh, but you cannot successfully moderate in my experience until you first abstained because it's the abstinence that resets the reward pathways that gives us access to more modest pleasures. If we just go from using a lot to using less, we never reset those reward pathways. So it does start with abstinence. This touches on a really interesting study that Anna featured in her book. So she's already spoken to and covered the fact that abstinence really helps us clear our heads. It's ultimately the best way to be able to live. If we have ambitions, if we want to get ahead and we know things are holding us back, being free of those things that are slowing us down and holding us back, that is ultimately the best way to live. But there are times we do not want to abstain, right? Or we simply can't. Like we just can't live our lives by abstaining. And here's where it gets really interesting now. For some people who can take months or years or even decades off from their addiction or their drug of choice, if they return, even months or years later, everything up here in their head seems to just snap back into place as if no time has passed at all. It's like something can be so imprinted on us that our brain goes, oh, I remember this. Oh, let's go back to our old habits. 
we do believe that there are there are some irreversible changes to the brain that occur as a result of addiction, such that even with sustained abstinence um, lasting years or decades, if that person were to return to using, they would potentially immediately slip right back into the, the height of their addictive use. There's a fascinating animal experiment demonstrating this where rats were exposed to cocaine, uh, an injection of cocaine daily for seven days and manifested a gradual progression in running in the cage um, as a result of the successive days of cocaine. So they started out as kind of a slow jog with cocaine. Rats normally just sort of hover on the side and don't move around all that much in the middle of the cage. But with each successive day of cocaine, by the seventh day, they were in a running frenzy. Then cocaine was removed for almost a year, which is a rat lifetime. And then the, the, and the rats stopped running around in, in that interim. And then those same rats were injected again with a single dose of cocaine, and they immediately began running as they had done on day seven of their original cocaine series, telling you that there was some latent scar or some echo in the brain uh, of that cocaine exposure, such that even just one dose got them right back into that. So, so that's really what's so difficult you know, about, about addiction and, and about relapse is that um, when people are exposed to their drug of choice again, they can find themselves you know, deep in their addiction really instantly and then have great difficulty getting out. But what I always say to patients, because this can be sort of demoralizing for them is, you know, that time, any amount of time of abstinence or recovery that you have is really a touchstone. You can always image that, you know, our mental imagery and remember what that was like. And you can always go back to that. You did it once, you can do it again. And so this is this is what I guess I really wanted to touch on. It, it struck me in reading the book and thinking about my own um, areas of improvement in my life that that abstinence is really the most trustworthy way to approach any of these things. We we know we know that that we're doing these things that don't help us. They don't serve us. They don't really make us feel good in the long run. Um, we're carrying all the stress, all the weight, maybe secrecy, all of these things that we're worried about. And so if we can get ourselves clean over the course of the four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, we can then clear our head. We can then step back. We can actually see how these behaviors may have been hurting us. And we can actually see on the other side how much better off we may be. And truthfully, abstinence is just the simplest, lowest, lowest denominator. Nothing fancy about it. Just stay away from it and it will continue to serve you. Often, I, I, the, where I'm going with this is I think we want a better answer. I think, I think we want all a better answer, but the truth is if you just stay away from those activities, you will be better off, as hard as that may be. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that abstinence is really hard and that we're left with a lot of uncomfortable feelings and that we can't just reach for some other reward to replace the reward we're abstaining from because then we're liable to get addicted to that other behavior. So it requires something very hard, which is sitting with a discomfort of withdrawal. But the frame that I think is so important and is really a reframe given our modern culture is that we are giving ourselves a gift, an important gift when we abstain. We're doing something really positive, potentially really positive for ourselves by allowing our brains to reset, by stimulating our dopamine to factories to start upregulating and making their own dopamine again. And that eventually with enough time, and again, typical typically takes 30 days, we'll get to a place where we will reap the rewards of that, of that activity. And so I think the reframe is again, that we're, we're doing something positive for ourselves rather than denying ourselves uh, some kind of reward that we need and want. I believe that Warren Buffett said this. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but he, 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 he gives this analogy of he's going to buy you any car that you want. Uh, but the, the hitch is you have to have that car for the rest of your life. <laughs> and he asks, he asks, okay, I'm going to buy you any car that you want, but you have to have it for the rest of your life. How are you going to treat this car? You're going to take yeah. care of it. You're going to try and baby it. You're going to only take it out. You're going to maintain it. You're going to do all of those things. Right. Well, what we're looking at in the mirror is that car. Yes. We, were, we were given that car. It's with us for the rest of our lives. How are we going to treat ourselves and how are we going to maintain this? Because frankly, 
Um, I, th- I think we're all doing a pretty bad job of it as a collective, especially today. I don't think enough of us are worried about uh, our stress levels, our schedules, our mental health, um, what we eat, how we exercise, how we move. But I think most of us actually think, well, it's too late. You've worked with tons and tons, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people at all these various stages of their life. What do you tell people who just have this more hopeless feeling of, well, I've been doing it this long, you know, I, I guess this is it for me, or, or they just come to a point of acceptance? There, there's always hope. And I've seen people even in their 50s, 60s, and 70s get into recovery from really severe addictions. So if they can do it, really the rest of us can do it, right? Um, and, you know, 30 days in the broad scheme of our lives isn't really all that long. Trust me, in those 30 days when we're trying to abstain, it can seem like eternity, um, but but in the grand scheme of things, it's not all that long. And so I really just challenge people to look at it as an experiment. And I mean, life in general is one big experiment. We're always trying to fine tune it, right? And, and kind of figure out, well, how can I make things a little bit better? How can I how can I bring myself a, a little bit of relief from the pain of living? And again, this is the counterintuitive paradoxical piece of this that to bring ourselves some little modicum of relief in, in our lives, we need to reject those things that give us immediate pleasure and embrace the things that are hard. And that this has physiological consequences. It's not just psychological uh, consequences, which are huge too, like just the, you know, the sense of confidence or competence or empowerment. There's actual physiology at play here. Um, that can ultimately be changed to make our everyday experience um, more more enjoyable, less stressful, um, more rewarding. I, I'm going to keep playing this life hack angle because I, I've got to believe or hope that there's some way to approach this. It, is it healthy for you to pick your your career, your passion, your hobbies, organize your life in a way where you're picking those challenging things, you're picking the healthier things, and at the same time, you're able to actually get dopamine hits from doing the right things. I guess the the danger in this paradigm of, you know, seek your passion and, and you know, pedal to the metal and, you know, no regrets is, of course, that we can get addicted to this notion of accomplishment and the ways in which our will chases this reward. And that, just like any other drug, ultimately runs out, right? We, we get some great, we, we reach our accomplishment and then, gosh, you know, maybe it didn't feel as good as we thought it would feel. Or no sooner have we gotten there and we have like, you know, half an hour of euphoria, but then we have a come down, an actual come down from having achieved so it, it can get very tricky, um, especially in this world of social media, where the potential audience is enormous, uh, which then amplifies the, the potential dopamine hits from the accomplishment. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm as vulnerable as, as any human to kind of these sorts of external rewards, but I don't think ultimately it's where we're going to find the most fulfilling path. I think we have to really be in the process of whatever it is we do and make sure that, I mean, my personal belief is that we have to sort of take ourselves out of the equation and that the meaning and purpose has to come from what the good that we hope, you know, the work will achieve rather than the meaning and accomplishment coming out of, um, I did this. I'm actually just reminded now of my mom when she was growing up. She's in her late 60s. But when she was growing up, there was uh, an uncle from uh, New York State. We live in Canada here. But uh, he would come up and he would spend four or five days with them like every three years. And she loved this man. She adored this man. She wished that he would stay for longer. And he had this saying about only stay uh, you know, with those you love for very short amounts of time. Good advice or bad advice, but the, the reason I'm reminded of this is he proactively made this idea of like the time spent together so much more meaningful if you do it infrequently 
and you really value it for what it is. If we're in this world of all of these dopamine hits and we have, we have to work and we, we have to take pleasure and we have to face pain and we have to do these things, I guess, how do we, how do we navigate it? Is it all about a lot of variety? Is it all about being really diligent with moderation? Is it about only focusing these types of this advice that we're giving on the things that are holding you back the most and not worrying about the rest so you don't become neurotic about this? Like, what do we do now that we know this? You know, to me, I think it's really all about finding the balance. And I give very practical tips for how to do that, how to reset reward pathways so that we can have balance in a dopamine overloaded world where we're constantly being inundated with these kinds of rewards. Um, But I wonder if there's even a place beyond that, which is going to sound really strange, but I probably really do believe this, that, um, that at some point, if we can get to a place where we're really not even looking for rewards, so we're not bookending our day uh, with rewards. I, I haven't gotten there. Trust me. I, I have all kinds of little ways I reward myself through the day. But I wonder if even that on some level, um, you know, contributes to some unhappiness and that really the way to go through life is to not expect, anticipate or plan for any reward at all. <laughs>